Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Our guest in this edition is retired U.S. Army Lieutenant General Patricia Horaho. She served as the 43rd Surgeon General of the U.S. Army. General Horaho was not only the first female, but the first nurse to serve in this role in Army history. During her 33 years on active duty, from tending to victims of the 9-11 terrorist attacks and wounded soldiers returning from the Iraq War, Horaho proved she was capable of leading in some of the most difficult circumstances in the military medical community. General Horaho was raised in Army culture, literally from her first breath. She was born on base while her father served the nation in uniform. I was born at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and my dad fought World War II, Korea, Vietnam, served in the 82nd and Special Forces when they, when they were first stood up. So Fort Bragg is home, and it's a military town. Uh, growing up in a military town and in a military family, and I would also say a military community, um, really impacted my view of service from the perspective of servant leadership, of really wanting to be part of something much greater than yourself and um, appreciating being born in the United States and all the values that come with that. I was able to follow in the footsteps of my father who came into the military as a 17-year-old, fought World War II, Battle of the Bulge, was honored actually two August ago for liberating St. Césaire. They reached out to us after 70 years and said, are you related to Frank Dallas? And they said, if you are, we want to honor him and his family because he gave us freedom. And what that showed me is the impact that the American service member has, not just on the United States, but around the world. And so I'm very proud to follow in his footsteps. I'm proud to follow in the footsteps of all of our service members who have given so much to this nation. After earning advanced degrees in nursing, Horaho would put her skills and knowledge to the test in two very difficult tragedies. The first was known as the Green Ramp Disaster, which occurred at Pope Air Force Base, North Carolina, on March 23, 1994. A mid-air collision and subsequent crash on the ground killed 24 servicemen and injured 100 others. Horaho was serving as the head nurse for the Womack Medical Base at the time, just two miles away from the disaster. Amazingly, she had begun planning for this kind of disaster before it happened. I obtained my master's at the University of Pittsburgh to get a degree as a trauma clinical nurse specialist, and my utilization assignment was Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and being the head nurse of Womack Army Medical Center. And when I got assigned there, one of the first things that I looked at is how do we ensure we're ready for any mass casualty? And we created the scenario of planes colliding and having multi-trauma trauma victims coming in. And we were supposed to have that exercise in April. And in March, I had, um, actually I remember it, Sergeant um, Layton came in and said, Captain Horaho, we had an emergency at Pope Crash where planes collided and trauma victims are coming in. And I said, oh, this must be our MASCAL exercise. He said, no, it's real. And within 15 minutes, we started having injured soldiers that arrived. Um, their uniforms completely burnt off. They were stacked on top of each other because they truly did the scoop and run method at the impact site. And um, within an hour, we had 134 burn victims that arrived at our emergency room and 22 of them on ventilators. And I think what I always remember on that day is having to go back to University of Pittsburgh because it kind of really helped give the skill sets to be ready for that day. And so my first thesis was on critical incident stress debriefing. And after 22 typed page, I mean, actually 60 typed pages, um, I wasn't able to get enough patients for the research study. And so then I went and started pursuing burn dressings and 60 typed pages again. And they had some challenges at one of the hospitals, and we weren't able to get enough trauma patients. So I ended up doing a research study comparing two different types of dressings. And so when I got assigned to Womack, um, all of those skill sets were utilized on that day and the aftermath. And I have vowed since that day, and I've never missed a time when I've talked about the Green Rant to tell this one story, because Sergeant Price was an African-American soldier 
who was one of the 500 paratroopers that were on the ground. And when the planes collided, there was 50,000 gallons of fuel that ignited and a fireball went across the entire green ramp. Sergeant Price turned to Specialist Wingfield, who he didn't know, who was a white female soldier, and he picked her up, looked her in the eye, and threw up in the air, got on top of her, whispered in her ear, and said, I want you to run now. And she ran. And when she ran and looked back, she realized that he took the fireball, the brunt of it, and saved her life. And what it imprinted on my heart to this day is that we are American soldiers. And it doesn't matter what our ethnicity, our religion, our political views, what we focus on is humanity and really living up to the American values. And so I think I learned preparedness. I learned compassion. I learned the importance of readiness and training. I also learned the importance of every challenge we go through in life gives us a skill set to be ready for the next challenge and opportunity in front of us. Seven years later, in August of 2001, Horaho was assigned to the Pentagon. It wasn't long before she experienced premonitions that her new place of employment would soon be facing a major disaster as well. And when the terrorist attack happened on September 11th, Horaho immediately ran to help. My story of 9-11 actually began in August of that year, and I had just finished the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, got assigned to the Pentagon, and I remember walking through the central area where they called Ground Zero. It was a central courtyard, and it was a beautiful sunny day, and the leaves were just kind of fluttering, and I heard this voice, and it was just as if you and I were talking, and it said, you're going to be attacked while you're there, and you need to be prepared. And I remember just thinking to myself, okay, and that was it. And then on September 11th, I was riding um, the Metro in, reading the book, God is My CEO. And I remember thinking, what a beautiful day. And it was this bright blue sky, very similar to actually the Green Rant disaster of this bright blue sunny day. And I walked into my office and I picked up a legal document and I was walking into the hallway. And as clear as day, I could hear this voice that said, don't go down that hallway. And so I turned and walked across to where Kathy Abel and Holly Russell were, and they were in our congressional liaison office. And I said, what are you doing? And they said, we're watching the Twin Tower just got attacked. And I looked at them and I said, there's gonna be a series of attacks across the United States and we're next. And I turned and I went back to my office and as soon as I put my foot in the doorway, the whole Pentagon just shook. And I thought, this is it. And so as we started leaving, I remember turning to Susie and I said, I'm going to go to the attack site. And I wanted someone to know so they didn't think I was missing. And I ran to the attack site, and it was just this large gaping hole in the Pentagon. And there was smoke, and there were um, parts of the debris of the airplane all over. And um, Specialist Sepulveda happened to be outside, saw the plane going in. And so it was the two of us who kind of united, and we just started triaging and taking care of patients. and. Um, and, and really trying to do the most we could to help others. Horaho says her trauma experience proved very valuable in treating victims at the Pentagon, and she marveled at how everyone, of every rank, immediately did whatever was necessary to help. On 9-11 and looking at um, triage, it's kind of, one, it's your training. Training as a trauma clinical nurse, so regardless of what your assignment, you default to your basic skill sets. and. I remember looking at landmarks and saying, okay, this is where we're gonna put this tree, we'll be expectant, this tree is gonna be immediate, this is where we'll have our delayed, um, because we didn't have anything to tag them, and so we just did geographical landmarks. We had Specialist Cahill, who um, was a medic, had his aid bag home with him, he was on leave, and he literally saw the fireball from the Pentagon and ran two miles, and because he did that, we had an aid bag, and so we started you know, started IVs. I remember um, Brigadier General Webster actually came up and he said, what can I do? I said, you need to give me your belt now. And I used that as a tourniquet to start IVs. So everybody, regardless of their rank, regardless of their background, everybody came together um, to really help the wounded. And, you know, we had, there were still air threats so that we had to keep relocating our sites because the FBI 
um, and others were saying, air threats, we need to move. And so we relocated like three times um, during that time. We were able to get some evacuated out, then they grounded all planes, airlifts. And so um, it was just being very agile. It was um, responding to where the need was. Um, it was utilizing everybody that was there. There happened to be um, a chaplain's conference that was ongoing that day. So we had chaplains everywhere for, to be able to provide psychological support. We utilized individuals um, to teach them how to be litter bearers, to go into the burning building um, after they stopped the burning and it was smoke filled. We had firefighters, EMS, that went in where there was gasoline and smoke filled and um, debris everywhere. And their first thought was how do we get as many people out of that burning building without worrying about whether or not they were putting themselves at risk. Horaho's actions on 9-11 garnered recognition from the American Red Cross. On September 14, 2002, she was one of 15 nurses selected as a nurse hero. What she marvels at most, however, is how all Americans banded together in the immediate aftermath of the attacks and in preparing for the war that followed. I think what sticks with me the most from that day, it was this one moment, and you know in movies when everything slows down, like really slow action and you watched it, there was a moment where that's what it was and I was looking and I thought, this is what war feels like. Our nation has been attacked, our powerhouse of our country has been attacked and I had this peace in me of knowing we're going to be okay. That the reason why we're called the United States of America is that we will unite together and fight this enemy. It was um, an incredible feeling that is still with me today. And then later that night, um, seeing the firefighters standing on top of the Pentagon roof and watching the flag unfurl, it was the most emotional feeling. But it made me realize that enemies may think that we were vulnerable, but what they miss is regardless of our political differences, our ethnicity, and our religion, we all come together because of our beliefs as Americans. And it, um, it, it just has stuck with me since that day. We'll have much more of General Horaho's story in just a moment here on Veterans Chronicles. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Our guest this week is retired U.S. Army Lieutenant General Patricia Horaho. She became the first woman ever to serve as Surgeon General of the U.S. Army. We've discussed her excellent preparation for the Green Ramp disaster and her rapid response to the 9-11 terrorist attack at the Pentagon. In the months and years that followed, Horaho steadily earned greater and greater leadership roles, including the command at Fort Belvoir, Walter Reed, and other very prominent military medical facilities. But regardless of the assignment, Horaho says her mission and goals remained very clear. Horaho later went on to command at Fort Belvoir, Walter Reed, and other very prominent military medical facilities. But regardless of the assignment, Horaho says her mission and goals were very clear. So my very first assignment commanding was Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and then after that I had the honor of commanding at Walter Reed Army Medical Center and then at um, Madigan Army Medical Center and then standing up a 22-state health system in the western region and then um, eventually commanding the medical command. And I would say what was important and maybe some commonality with leadership throughout all of that was one, creating a vision that inspired, that um, showed a pathway of how you improved quality of care, how you improved outcomes, how you improved readiness. It was also um, focusing on people and leader developing and ensuring that you manage talent appropriately. I think the third would be um, really understanding that it was organizational readiness and that you had to inspire people to want to come together in a way that allowed the mission to not only be accomplished, but to be um, extremely successful. So we would come up with taglines because I think that rallies people together. So as a certain general, it was serving to heal, honored to serve. And um, when I was commanding in the West, it was the best was in the West because we were going from a six state region to 22. And we wanted to have everybody kind of unify around a particular 
um, kind of rally cry. But I think the most important is the vision and then um, holding people accountable and having clarity of what that mission is. For Horaho, her time at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center will always hold a special place. She says the strong morale and determination of the soldiers returning from the war zones was very motivating. My assignment at Walter Reed, I think, will always be something I hold dear in my heart. It, one, it was truly a place where we saw the most injured service members coming through and their families. And you saw the devastation that war can have on an individual and, and people who loved them. But you also saw the strength and the determination and the resiliency. And every single one of our wounded warriors would want to know what's going on with their battle buddies on the battlefield. They, they wanted to get well and they wanted to redeploy again, or they wanted to get well and do something that allowed them to give back to those that were giving the, to this nation. Their resiliency is um, something we should value, we should thank each and every day because it is absolutely amazing and it's very humbling. And we had our wounded warriors coming in um, three times a week and our, everyone would come out to greet them. And then it was quickly getting ready and wrapping our arms and our capabilities around them and their families. And um, Walter Reed had um, expert care, whether it was rehabilitative medicine, whether it was behavioral health, concussive care. And we really learned to create a system of care. And a lot of that was learned out of the hardship um, that happened when the Walter Reed story broke. The Walter Reed story that General Horaho referenced began in February 2007, when the Washington Post published a series of articles on the deteriorating conditions and neglect of wounded soldiers at the facility. While the nation was horrified by details of the story, Horaho says the appalling conditions truly served as a wake-up call that our nation was in a long-term conflict. And so one of the things that I would say is during that time frame, it truly was the perfect storm because prior to the, the big break in the news about Walter Reed and the question of really um, were we providing the right care to, the, to our wounded warriors, prior to that, Walter Reed had been identified for uh, base realignment and closure. And, and so they were downsizing in personnel. They did a military to civilian um, conversion. And it meant that any job that was military converted to civilian. If it was civilian, it converted to a contractor. When it was BRAC, you could not spend dollars by law to improve infrastructure. And so I'll give a good example. In Building 18, which was the front page story of Walter Reed Crises, Building 18, a year before, had mold in the room because of the leaky roof. We could not spend the money to fix the leaky roof. We could only clean out the mold. So they cleaned out the mold, and then a year later, it had mold because it's still a leaky roof. And I think really the heart of it was our nation believed we were in a 100-day war, except that this was six to seven years into a war. And I think it took Walter Reed for us all to step back and say, we're in this for a long haul. We needed to change our policies, our funding, and to be perfectly honest, our entire continuum of care changed um, because of this in a very good way. Horaho continued to rise in the Army medical ranks. And in 2011, President Barack Obama nominated Horaho to be the Surgeon General of the U.S. Army. But she says there was something she still had to do before she truly felt ready for the job. I had literally just flown um, to Australia, had been on the ground less than 24 hours, and General Casey called and said, hey, Patty, what are you doing? And I said, oh, sorry, I just, just got to Australia for this conference. And he said, I want to call and congratulate you. You've just been nominated as the 43rd Surgeon General. And he said, and now I need you to get on a plane and fly back home. And I remember going to General Schoomaker, who was the Surgeon General at, at the time, and then also General Corelli, who was the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. And I said, even though I deployed, it was many years before, I felt like if I was going to lead Army medicine, that I needed to deploy to Afghanistan and ensure I fully understood 
what our service members were encountering on the battlefield. After her appointment, Horaho deployed to Afghanistan. She traveled more than 4,000 miles and visited more than 200 forward operating bases and command posts. I learned so much. Um, I learned the importance of taking behavioral health and concussive care and integrating that together. We set up concussive care centers across the theater of operation. We actually had virtual behavioral health that went out to some of the most remote sites because there were individuals that literally were coming under attack every day and if we waited to get them behavioral health until they redeployed back, then it would be much more um, complicated to be able to treat them. So we got virtual behavioral health out there, and it was our medical team that innovated at that moment to change the way trauma care is now delivered in the U.S. We learned so much about the ability to save a life at the point of care where our young soldiers were all trained on first aid, on trained on intubation. They were trained to provide blood at the point of injury, which really led to unexpected survival. And we had individuals that were injured, and in less than 36 hours, they were back in the United States receiving um, level four care at our premier medical centers. I think what it says is that we have highly trained, highly educated, highly motivated, healthcare workers that are willing to don the cloth of our nation, place themselves in harm's way, and take care of our war fighters. And what our war fighters are able to place themselves in harm's way, because they know that they have the best military medical care that will be there if they're injured. I think what weighed on me the most during the years of serving as Surgeon General was this need to have the transformation across all of Army medicine as we moved away from a disease model of care to a system for health. And we changed every aspect of the way that we delivered. And I knew that if we did not improve the health of our service members and the health of our families, then we would not be honoring the commitment to those that were raising the right, the right hand. There was also the strategic vulnerability that only 25% of our youth, 17 to 23, were eligible to serve in our armed forces. And so we had to really ensure that we were helping to improve the health of our nation. And so our vision was actually to improve the health of our nation by improving the health of our army. And it was this transformation that I think drove all of the actions that we took during those four years. Horaho served four years as Surgeon General of the U.S. Army and she is very proud of the culture shift that she was able to oversee in Army medicine. Greatest satisfaction over those four years were, was the culture change that we created. And it was really um, the mindset both of our Army and of Army medicine of the focus on improving one's health, of taking health care outside of the bricks and mortar of a hospital, and into the life space where you live, labor, and love. And so I always said, you have 525,600 minutes in a year. And we realized that if we only focused on when a patient came to us, that's about 100 minutes that we could impact their health. And all of those other minutes are outside of the bricks and mortar of our healthcare facility. And so we took our behavior health, we took our physical therapists, our dietitians, and we embedded them into the units. We did habitual relationships so we could really focus on prevention and keeping people well, and then um, having a entire care system with a continuum of care that was focused on health and wellness. Of course, General Horaho is also a trailblazer. As the first female nominated to be Army Surgeon General, Horaho says she recognizes how her position impacted not just the country, but the entire world. You know, being the first of anything, um, I think, comes with tremendous responsibility because I always felt like it's not so much being the first. I just didn't want to be the last because I really believe that anybody is the first, whether it's a male or female, you are setting the pathway for others to follow. And so served as the first female in Walter Reed um, in 98 years, uh, it dated back to the Civil War. And um, so was the first female, first um, non-physician, 
serving as a certain general when I got selected. I got a call, I'll never forget, because I was deployed in Afghanistan and it was from the United Kingdom, one of my colleagues. And he said, I want to congratulate you on being selected. How does it feel to know the entire world is going to watch to see if you succeed or fail? And I remember holding the phone thinking, okay, I'm not sure this is a congratulatory call, but what it did for me is it opened my lens. And it made me realize that what the United States does is very important on the global platform. And when I was meeting um, with the leaders from Israel and then some France, um, especially the Israeli Surgeon General, General Grice at that time, he said, Patty, do you want to know what the conversation was when you got selected as Surgeon General? I said, I'd love to know. And he said, it was the shot that was fired around the world. He said, the entire you know, military of many countries got together and talked. And what they talked about was not that the United States picked a nurse. It's that the United States picked a female to serve as the U.S. Surgeon General. And he said it forced us to have a conversation on what we're doing to ensure that we're training and opening opportunities for females to be promoted and to move up to the highest position. Throughout 30 years of service, General Horaho demonstrated tremendous leadership in the midst of crisis, and her abilities led to her holding several very high leadership positions, including Surgeon General of the Army. But she says she gets the most pride out of something far more important than any title that she held while in uniform. I think what I'm most proud of in the time in uniform really goes back to my retirement. And when I was retiring the night before, and I was walking into downtown DC and kind of rehearsing what I was gonna say in my retirement speech, my son called me and he was in RTC and he said, mom, is it strange feeling to think that I've got sadness to know that you won't be putting on your combat boots every day like I am, that we shared that experience together. And it was at that moment I thought, that really is a symbolism of what it is to be an American soldier. It is the shared experience. It's being part of a team of teams. It is realizing that you are part of a legacy that goes back to 1775 and that people are willing to die for the values of our country. And so I think what I'm most proud of is being an American soldier. Lieutenant General Patricia Horaho, U.S. Army, retired. She was also the first woman ever to serve as Surgeon General of the U.S. Army. I'm Greg Corumbus, and this is Veterans Chronicles. Hi, this is Greg Corumbus, and thanks for listening to Veterans Chronicles, a presentation of the American Veterans Center. For more information, please visit AmericanVeteransCenter.org. You can also follow the American Veterans Center on Facebook and on Twitter, we're at AVC Update. Subscribe to the American Veterans Center YouTube channel for full oral histories and special features. And of course, please subscribe to the Veterans Chronicles podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and please join us next time for Veterans Chronicles.